Good evening, and thank you so much, Francesca, and thanks, Trevor, for two super inspiring talks. And um, yeah, I think I can speak for everybody that um, both contributions have been extremely helpful in setting the tone and the agenda for uh, the con conference this weekend. So I suggest let's just stay on this big picture overview because there's still a lot to talk about before we then dig deeper into projects and strategies from tomorrow on. Francesca, I would like um, to ask you a little bit more about your vision of data serenity. Uh, I think you, you did a great job in inspiring us of how, how a future could look like towards the end of your, of your talk. But given the next steps that really have to be taken, what would you say, what is important right now? Yes, so great. Thank you for the question. Um, I think I will start by saying that uh, for me, one of the main limitation of the tech conversation we are having is that it still stays in a very technology space. So the reason why I thought it was a great, um, was very important to do this kind of, um, let's say, new ownership data models from cities and really start experimenting and piloting new forms of data democracy in cities. It was really because we needed to communicate to citizens what were the benefit of data sovereignty. So instead of just having a conversation, which of course is very important uh, uh, regarding our privacy and information self-determination and cryptography and open protocols and open standards, which of course are things that I really care about, <laughs> but they stay in the kind of tech space. They appeal to developers, to technologies, to people that are very informed about what technology is. If you go in the street uh, in the post-pandemic times even more and you talk to people about you know, data sovereignty, they don't really get it. I mean, they don't understand what's the relationship between data sovereignty and affordable housing. They don't understand the relationship between da data sovereignty and better wages. They don't understand the relationship between data sovereignty and who is controlling the future of healthcare right, and, and redistribution of wealth in the economy. So I wanted to, you know, to start from a point to make this very tangible, to tell people, you know, this is actually related to affordable housing. And of course, in Barcelona, we had a, a lot of <laughs> a very strong, uh, you know, popular movement that was protesting because of the uh, impact, uh, negative impact of Airbnb. I think in Berlin, you have a similar thing where you had a referendum uh, for like taking back the ownership of public housing uh, from, you know, big developers. These kind of things have to be tangible and they have to show that, uh, okay, you know, we can, we can have a, a, yeah, a strong alliance of people that understand why it is important to reclaim the sovereignty or our data and why, you know, for instance, data is absolutely crucial for net zero policies in cities, right? Because if you don't know uh, CO2 emissions, if you don't have a map of CO2 emissions, if you don't know how much electricity you're spending, how much, you know, how much retrofitting your house can you know, you, you can consume less energy. All of these actually, you know, who is controlling data and how then data is used is, is very important. And then, of course, the kind of stuff that I show you about the value of data in today's economy, which is very important uh, because it's a fictitious commodity and it's creating these bubbles in the big tech economy. So uh, I think that that was my starting point, but I'm completely aware, and that's why I started from a big picture that tells you, okay, you know, we have these kind of big players, which are the big tech, eight to nine, 10 trillion that they control in the economy. Then we have the asset manager capitalism. We have this big picture. We need to do it at least starting from EU level and say this is going also be about um, big um, infrastructure development. So I think this is a big thing that we have to discuss, you know, because I, I understand um, in order to democratize this digital economy, the big infrastructures we need are actually requires long-term 
public and private investment. So I'm actually happy that now, because of the uh, pandemic, we have three trillions uh, recovery in Europe, around three trillion euros. We have the national recovery plans, which are investing a lot of money into the green and digital transition with social cohesion. And I think it is our task to make sure it happens the way we are envisioning here, because, you know, uh, it also can reinforce the status quo even more, and we know that. So we have to make sure that this happens democratizing really and engaging communities. And just to be more specific about the data sovereignty, I want to see a model that's not only big tech but versus big state. I think I made it very clear at, the, at the, my last uh, uh, slide. You know, I don't want to see, okay, either we have the big tech companies, even if we have the big tech that are European, and then the other model is the state will control the data centrally. I think this is not enough for us, and it is going to present us with new types of problems. So we need a new, another way, which is really more about people controlling this data and, the, and, the, and, and controlling the digital infrastructure of our critical infrastructure of our time. So with data, I think we need a, a type of data trust that can envision where a part of the infrastructure can be public. I think, for example, that data can be partly public and partly controlled by citizens. Some personal data can co be controlled by citizens themselves. They need to know what data is their data, have privacy control, and then share their data based on you know, how they want to share their data and have their collective rights enforced. But I think part of this infrastructure should be public. So it's going to be a mix between public infrastructure, citizens control data, and then we need to enforce rules for the big tech to share data with us, because this is the problem. How do we enforce uh, data sharing mandates on the big tech? And this is very complicated, because public interest data and how do you define that is very complicated, both legally and at an economic level is also uh, complex. But I think, uh, for example, a conversation with Trebor can be, I'm working with the labor ministry in uh, Italy now and in Spain for algorithmic control that impact labor negotiations. Because in the gig economy platforms, you know, the boss can be an algorithm, I mean, um, unquote. Meaning that the algorithm can have an impact on your working condition, on you and your reputation, because of your reputation, and we saw cases happening, you can be fired. And also, they have a very strong impact in collective bargaining and collective negotiation. So the unions are not there yet. They're not having this conversation. We want transparency and mandatory access to data and algorithms because they have an impact on collective rights and collective negotiations. And I think we have to push this very strongly as a society. Yeah. Thanks so much for this clarification and expansion on your previous ideas. Thanks a lot. And I also noticed that you uh, would like to get maybe some responses from Trevor on some of the points you have mentioned. Um, and I guess you will also respond to some of them. But I have a question for you because you showed us uh, how um, how platform co-ops actually scale, not up, but rather the scaling deep. And I'm wondering, Trevor, if you could expand a little bit on your vision of this scaling up, maybe even on a global or planetary level. <laughs> yeah, no, I think it's really important, right, like to hold, does this work here? Uh, when I think of uh, American labor history, right, there's this uh, amazing quote from uh, 1898 from the labor annals, which uh, read that for people to own uh, the monopoly, you know, that it would be better for people to own the monopolies than for the monopolies to own the uh, the people. But sure, right, so most people here in this room would probably agree, but the question is how, right? So how do we do this? So Francesca laid out this very clear vision for European uh, legislation. Uh, which I completely, you know, so support. But I think also there are, of course, limitations to that too, like what can actually be implemented. Uh, so, uh, so for me, like a big vision is really one of a sort of transnational pluralist uh, ecosystem, right? So I imagine like a network rather than a bulwark, right? And building on the history of the cooperative commonwealth, like an economy made up of many small autonomous cooperatives that then as networks compete against these large corporations. 
Um, and, but, and also, I mean, the research shows that the cooperative form isn't really suitable, right, for all sectors. Uh, so I think it's important to acknowledge that this larger vision also has to be a bricolage of different organizations, uh, making up worker and user-owned businesses, not-for-profits, like I said, unionized private organizations, publicly-owned digital marketplaces, you know, and hybrids among all of these. And so it's a vision that doesn't really prioritize like one model over the other um, and, uh, and basically tailors it to these different sectors uh, because I think the sectors demand different sizes and structures, right? So to say like everything should be a large cooperative, I don't think would really work. And I think, so this is really important that uh, I think many for people here in the room also that we should really stop uh, these uh, you know, circular firing squads about like whose solution is better or like how, you know, like to fetishize one organizational form over the other, right? But to understand that we're really together in this, in the building of the sort of larger pluralistic uh, ecosystem. Uh, and so it's a commons, a commonwealth that co-produces uh, a commons Right, this, this, uh, this proposed digital pluralist commonwealth would be rooted in, uh, and yes, I have some notes on this, uh, so we actually you know, rehearsed this before, uh, in shared data agreements, cooperative data trusts, and so on, and uh, you know, community-stewarded AI, token systems, participatory budgeting, and you know, distributed decision-making, and also, you know, again, like drawing on the legacies of antitrust and nationalization, right? We see exactly as Francesca said that there's a promising strategies to, let's say, halt Amazon's power grab, right? There's the anti antitrust agenda, especially uh, picking up steam with legal scholar and chair of the Federal Trade Commission, right? Our friend uh, Lina Khan. Or, you know, look to Argentina, where you have a national postal service uh, implementing a state owned online marketplace. Etc. But their historical merits and future potential, however, right, both antitrust and nationalization have significant limitations. Uh, for example, breaking up Amazon as such would do nothing to alter the exploitative nature or underpinning the corporation's various branches. Uh, nationalization would cut Amazon's global logistics network into disparate pieces, uh, which would eventually regain dominance. So beyond doubts about the likelihood of nationalization, which would be like a whole other question, it would also run the danger of replacing Amazon's private stranglehold over local economies with uh, US government-led data colonialism. Right? So if we acknowledge that, and while I fully support right, antitrust and unionization and nationalization and the creation of really all forms of associa associational power among workers, uh, I think cooperativism really offers uh, an appealing alternative uh, to challenge these existing, uh, this existing corporate monoculture. And there's much more to say about this, but maybe we should be more dialogical and not engage. Yeah. Yeah, thanks for that. Uh, Francesca, if there are any points you would like to respond, please do. But I would also like to tie in a question uh, that emerged while I was listening to your talk, and that's about values, right? So, and it's also about the expectations that many people have towards the Euro European Union when it's about, you know, democratizing uh, the platform economy as we know it. Where um, do you see a more humane version of the digital economy emerging in Europe? And are there any examples where you say this is really interesting to look uh, at? Sure. Well, I actually agree with the fact that we have to go beyond Europe, right? So don't get me wrong there. I don't want to reproduce this kind of Eurocentric view because it doesn't make any sense today. But I, I think that uh, we have a fight to, <laughs> to here in Europe to, to really be, um, to happen. And this, uh, this fight is really about democratizing this, this economy at the moment. And I think, obviously, I try to explain in my talk when we talk about the digital economy, it's not a digital economy separated from the rest of the economy, right? I mean, it's, uh, we, we are just showing how these big tech companies are becoming much more dominant in today's economy and their power and their infrastructural power, which I think it's something very strong because they have a very strong financial power, but the infrastructural power for me is very worrying because as I said uh, also during my talk, 
And it was very clear during the pandemic when all of a sudden, because we had this rapid digitization, kind of quickly bringing, you know, smart working and distance education and lots of like online services, we understood how, like, how dependent on a certain point we were on big tech run infrastructure for, 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 for basic essential services of society. So who is running those critical infrastructures today? And do we have the capacity, not only investment capacity, but real industrial and societal capacity to run it democratically as a society? I think the answer today is no. And this is worrying for, for, for a lot of different reasons. And, and for me, Europe, OK, yes, the question is about fundamental rights, is about socioeconomic rights, and is about redistribution of wealth and power. Yes, I think Europe has a very advanced tradition jurisprudentially when it comes to constitutional rights. I mean, here you have the rights to information self-determination, which is absolutely in contrast with the logic of the, 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 with, with the business logic of the platform economy, no doubts. I mean, how do you justify an economy that's run on monetizing and manipulating personal data and information? Well, actually, if you look at our constitution, it should be illegal. Now, can you make it illegal by law? Not really sure. The data protection regulation, I mean, goes close to that, but obviously it's not implemented at its full possibility. But I mean, you would say specific business models that we see happening, and that's why I was citing this um, whistleblower from Facebook, because she was there and she was saying, you know, this is absolutely critical for society because, you know, young people are getting crazy and because you're creating all these negative externalities and this conspiracy and hate speech and populism and blah, blah, blah. It is an externality of the business model. So I think, I think this is where Europe sh could be much stronger to put forward, you know, our constitutional rights and principles and to say, well, we have to find a different business model. I mean, this is not going to work for our society. And so, so I, I believe we, we're still possibly on time to give this fight, but on this, on this level I can be, you know, some people tell me you are so optimistic. I mean, are you crazy? Look at the market data. I mean, you are just uh, out, you know, you cannot do it. But I believe, you know, this is not, you know, this is the beginning of the industrialization of this of the internet, if you want. So we are still at a moment where this is now becoming inside our society in many different sectors and is now disrupting the welfare state, healthcare, education, and so on. We need to decide as a society where we are going, right? What is going to be the model? And on top of that, just to be realistic, the climate emergency and the climate crisis just makes this so much more of an issue. Because I think, and I, I was trying to actually a little bit rethink my entire work at the light of what's happening, or, or our consciousness about what's happening, because what's happening we know, but let's say our popular consciousness about what's happening by saying, right, if we do not put all of this at the service of decarbonizing the economy, changing the, um, you know, changing completely uh, the production system and the economic uh, development model as such, we are dead. So, you know, so this should be the focus, right? And it should be the focus. And I think then this big green deal or big green state or whatever, I think the role of the state can be another conversation, but maybe not for now, <laughs> for another event. But I think even the, the state and the possibility of a democratic state, you know, to, with the fiscal and economic capacity, with the kind of social power, the, even the bottom-up struggle, but we need that in order to give a direction to what's happening. In order to achieve this vision, we need that absolutely. I mean, now in Germany, you're changing government, you have a coalition, coalition agreement. I, I really think we should put those topics in the agenda, and like urgently so, because otherwise, um, I'm afraid we're gonna be speaking ourselves. We are all already convinced that we need to democratize, but you know, there are going to be much more bigger imperative, new crisis, the climate crisis, and pandemic crisis, the economic crisis, and at the end, all these propositive social changes are going to be actually harder to be implemented. And the risk it is, and I shut up, 
more authoritarianism. Yes, it is. I mean, we see it. You know, the models that we are confronted with, it's not more democracy. It's more authoritarianism. And that's why we have to push for big, I mean, for more democracy as a solution to this crisis. Because otherwise, there's going to be new kind of right-wing populism versus uh, authoritarianism. And, you know, how do we deal with this need of radically democratizing? Right, so when we, when we talked uh, earlier, when we prepared this, uh, we had this uh, really interesting, vibrant conversation, uh, very, very quickly heated, uh, which was essentially just what I would respond. It's like, I think that you're absolutely right. I mean, everything you say, I would completely support. Uh, but I think there's another side to that, which is, you know, when I think, and I gave this example when we talked, right? And I think of a worker in 1978 in the United States joining the labor market. Uh, they didn't have a pay increase uh, for their entire career, right? So adjusted for inflation, no pay increase, right? Since that time, uh, why productivity spiked, right? Uh, and so why politicians, policymakers, where for this entire same time, we're telling them that you know they are fighting for their rights and so on, and this is very important, right? I'm not at all making an argument against legislation or against policy at all, but I think there needs to also be a consideration, and it's not uh, some kind of short-termism or whatever folk politics or whatever you want to call it, for people now in their lifetime to actually have for these like 10 million platform-based workers perhaps, right? Like, I mean, all these things that you described, they are fantastic, right? So when will this be implemented, right? I mean, so, and I'm not saying that these long-term goals aren't important, and I think they are, and what you're doing is incredibly support, uh, amazing, and I support that, but I think that you, we also need to think about what can happen with this courier in Barcelona uh, next week. Right, and uh, so I, I realize that that is, of course, you know, thinking in the short term, and it's concrete, and people criticize that. But I think it's a very sort of elitist position to criticize that because you aren't in that position, right? So you are not out there in the street on your bike, doing this work. I'm not saying like you personally, but so so I think this is I think where I see that these sort of uh, uh, this cooperative ownership can give an answer and a support for people. Uh, to bridge, I guess, uh, until the time comes that these grand uh, democratic changes are, are all kicking in and we live in a new society and a new man will emerge or a new woman will emerge. Uh, I have been receiving signals here from... Uh, are, we, are we slowly coming to an end or is there... Okay, that's such a pity. I have so many questions, but um, that's it. Thank you so much, uh, Francesca and Trevor for your um, contributions. And uh, I think it was super inspiring. Thanks everybody. And I pass on the mic to Jonas.